Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the show, my name is Jay. I'm an investor. I'm here looking for the best home for my cash. If that sounds like you, then I think you're going to like what we do here. My guest today is Dave Hunter, crowd favorite and fascinating conversation. We cover a lot of ground. Tough for me to really tease you with what we talk about because we started with sort of near-term monetary policy leading into long-term empire cycles and everything in between. Most importantly, how do you build your bank account and set yourself up for success for the 2030s, which is what long-term value investors should be thinking about. So we talk about that a lot today. Now, quick announcement before we jump in. I'm hosting a live online private event on November 30th called Crisis and Chaos, the Changing World Order. And the guest roster at this event is arguably bigger than anything I've ever done. I'll be joined by a handful of US presidential advisors. I'll be joined by leaders from the United States, Secretary of Defense, by terrorism experts, Navy SEAL veterans, mercenary army leaders, and even one former Supreme Commander of NATO to talk about the shifting geopolitics that are occurring right now in front of our eyes. If you care at all about how the geopolitical chessboard is being reshuffled, then you can't miss this event November 30th. Go to crisisandchaosevent.com. There's a link right beneath this piece of content. Now here is David Hunter. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. Okay, here I am joined with by David Hunter. David, it's great to see you and thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, hi Jay, great to see you. So let's start with a uh, a broad question. Uh thinking through global economy, you know, I've got a high level understanding from our last discussion about, you know, where your sentiment lies and forecasts. Um when you think through long term, you know, global macro, uh what are some major shifts you think will be occurring within the 2020s that most people are misunderstanding or not paying enough attention to. Sure. Yeah. I, I view where we're at as very late in a super cycle. Um, I define the super cycle as uh, that long cycle between two depressions. So the 1930s was the last depression. I think the 2030s is going to be the next depression. So we're within the last decade. Um, I think as you get to the end, you're in you're at such extreme excesses in in lots of areas that you know volatility can be a lot um, higher. You can see big swings in both directions, and that's where I think we're at. You know, this last couple of weeks kind of is a, a beginning of what I think is a melt up. Um, uh, what I call them, I've been calling it melt up for a few years now meaning a final parab parabolic run-up in the uh, stock market, making a what I think will be a 41-year secular top and a high. At, at those highs, I don't think we're going to see those same levels again, maybe for decades. So, um, you know, there's one more cycle after this before I think we – we face a collapse of the financial system in the 2030s, but the stock market, I think, because of it, inflation and interest rates is probably going to peak here, and we'll have a, another cyclical bull in, you know, following what I call a global bust next year, um, but it won't get back to these highs. So if, if I'm right, you're going to have a huge bear market next year um, in combination with a global bust. I think you could go down to 80 percent. That's the biggest bear market we've had since 29, uh, if I'm right. So you could come out of that bear market, triple or quadruple your your market, and still be far below what I think are going to be the highs of this this secular peak. So I'm calling for six to seven thousand on the S&P um, in the next few months. Um, and so if you go down to 80 percent from that. You know, you're down in the 1,200, 1,400 area on the S&P. Even if you quintuple that, you're not back to six or 7,000. So, or certainly quadruple it and you're not. So, so you can have a big cyclical bull next cycle, but be within the context of a secular bear. And I don't think most people on the street are seeing that. You know, I think people just assume you go to higher highs every cycle. Um, I think we're, you know, we're looking at major tops here that are are not going to be exceeded for a long time. 
Okay, so reaching the sunset years of this secular bull market, and as you said, this is when everything starts to go a little bit wonky, and it's not hard to find examples of that, right? There's arguably bubbles in equities, real estate, bond market, you name it. We've seen it all. Um, you are sticking to your thesis from last time we spoke that the S and P could hit six thousand, seven thousand. I mean, that would be up, you know, forty percent, thirty percent from from today. So huge rally. Um, before a global bust um, leading into the late 2020s that would set us up for a full depression in the 2030s. Um, and then I believe you said you expect one more cycle before the collapse of the financial system, which could I word that and say, you know, a rotation of the world reserve currency? Is that what you're talking about when you say collapse of the financial system? And what's the one more cycle? Uh, I'll dig yeah, into that. So yeah, just to because I know it gets confusing. You're down, then you're up, then you're down, then you're up again. So just to kind of um, clarify the timing, a global bust, I believe, hits us next year after the secular peak in the market. So probably second half of next year, we have a what I would call something worse than 2008-9. Um, so, you know, an 80 percent bear market combined with a severe financial crisis where you can see some major banks go under, I think, more focused overseas, meaning, you know, Europe, maybe Asian and, you know, some of the other areas. The U.S. obviously got hit last cycle, so their banks are better capitalized this time around. So they're probably not as vulnerable as, for example, the European banks. So we get a bust next year. That's what we come out of and have a cyclical bull. So say starting Sometime in 2025, you begin a cyclical bull that can carry you into you know the end of the decade. It will be very different leadership. It will be led by um, commodities and industrial stocks rather than consumer and, and growth stocks. And the reason for that is that I believe it's going to be a huge inflation cycle um, triggered by the fact that the central banks around the world are going to have to respond to that global bust and that financial crisis with more money than they've ever had to respond before. So, you know, we just looking at the Fed, we had five trillion pumped in in 2020. I believe this time around, it's going to take at least 20 trillion to deal with what is going to be a free falling financial system. So, if you're looking, I mean, five trillion was off the charts. If you're looking at four times that, obviously talking about big money. Um, and I think every central bank will be doing something similar proportionally. So that that massive money with a lag will trigger an inflation cycle like we've not seen in this country. It'll be, exceed the early 80s. I think you could see 25 percent inflation rates by the end of the decade. Um, you know, oil at five hundred dollars, gold at twenty thousand, mm -hmm. silver at five hundred, um, copper through the roof, natural gas through the roof ag commodities through the roof. So it'll be across the board inflation. Uh, that will drive interest rates up to levels above the early 80s, meaning you know, long bond got up to 15 or 16% back then. I think it'll go higher than that this time around. Um, short rates will go into the 20s. Um, when you look at those kind of numbers, and you also look at the fact that, you know, and, and by the way, when I talk about 20 trillion in, in expanded balance sheet from the Fed, that's going to be matched by expanded fiscal uh, as they're trying to pull out of this this mess. You know, we're, we're talking about debt that cannot be serviced. If, if interest rates, they have trouble servicing at 5%. Yeah. What are they going to do if, if interest rates are 15% or 20%? So so I that's why you get a collapse. And I just want to clarify, I believe this collapse is is global it's not just the us every you know we're, we're in super cycle for the whole world i think that collapse is a collapse of the western financial system and maybe the eastern financial system i mean china's not, not in great shape either so um so it i think the 2030s are you know something far se more severe than the great depression was and i don't know what you know what comes out of that in terms of currency realignment it mm. certainly probably won't be the dollar <laughs> mm -hmm. um you know you're you're going to go through many years i think of kind of dealing with the fallout from a collapse and then you know and so in other words 
um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the Austrian school crowd that want to talk about a reset and getting away from central banking, et cetera. That's all nice. But I think people think reset means you kind of just reset the clock and, and move on. Yeah, they, There may be a reset, but it's not going to be without a huge amount of pain and dislocation uh, in the 2030s. As I say, and again, this is just seat of the pants, but we could be looking at 50% plus unemployment in this country, a government that's bankrupt, so no welfare system, no unemployment system, limit or no Medicare, Medicaid, uh, or Social Security. You know, we, and we have a, a population that is 50, at least 50 percent dependent on some sort of uh, government assistance. So, mm -hmm. I mean, where, where does that leave you? It leaves you in a pretty destitute place. Yeah, that's that sure does. Absolutely. OK, so I like the term currency realignment when you talk about, uh, you know, collapse of the financial system. That's really what we're discussing. It's the rotation of the world reserve currency probably the rotation of the global empire. And this happens with regular cyclicality, you know, in the last 600 years, we've gone through five empires. That's quite expeditious rotation of power, right? You've seen the Portuguese empire, the Spanish empire, the Dutch empire, the British empire. Today, it's the American empire, but that compressed timeline gives you a bit of a hint, you know, at how quickly power rotates. And, and uh, you know, it, you can look at it from that standpoint and say, it makes logical sense that we are in the sunset years. This is uh the current empire coming to an end. So a few things that definitely I've, I've heard uh, with consistency from some of the investors on my show that I, I have a lot of confidence in, you know, your, yourself obviously included in this pile is that, you know, the rotation in capital that we'll see coming out of a 2024 bust leading into a cyclical bull run for the balance of this decade, but not led by growth stocks and speculative tech equities, a return to value probably a return to yield. Some might say a return to common sense, but this is the sort of raw materials driven market, correct? Is that what you're, which is a market that's been starved of capital for the last 15 years because it's been, you know, for a handful of reasons, one of which it's been so easy to just chuck money at FANG stocks and see a decent return, but that game is coming to an end, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And talk about return of capital or, um, you know, availability of capital, the commodity area because we went through that long disinflation period before these last couple of years, commodities have been you know, out of favor for a long time. And commodity companies, in order to survive, had to rationalize down their capacity, right? So you've had you know, a lot of the mining area and places like that, it's, it's harder and harder to find um, new mine and new, new resources. Um, and, and at the same time, because of um, this massive printing of money that we're going to have on top of what we've already had, you jumpstart a, a demand cycle. And part of it's, you know, reshoring and things like that. Though that's why it's going to be industrial based. But um, you're going to have a huge demand for resources at a time when resources are scarce or certainly supply is limited. So mm -hmm. you're going to have this huge demand run up, you know, probably by the second half of the decade, um, coupled with a a constrained supply and what happens the only thing it can give is price so price goes vertical mm -hmm. and that's why i throw around numbers that sound insane like 500 dollar a barrel oil but that's what i think we're talking about and oil is a good example i mean look at what we're doing with with the whole climate change agenda uh, and the whole effort to kind of do away with fossil fuels we're not going to we're you know we're going to have another big fossil fuel demand cycle who knows what happens after the collapse, but certainly in the next the balance of this decade, fossil fuels are not going away. We we have nowhere near the alternative energy to substitute for fossil fuels. So you have this big demand because of an industrial recovery and limited supply. So, you know, oil goes through the roof. I mean, it's just, it's nonsensical, the kind of policies we've had um, driven by, you know, our, our government politicians who don't know any better. Can I ask you a question? So often, you know, getting back to the the sunset years of an empire, you see a lot of this activity sort of led by insolvency of the state, right? Um, overfunding entitlements, 
demographic issues where you have a larger population drawing on those entitlements and contributing to them. And this isn't just a modern problem. You know, it was the same with the grain dole in the Roman Empire. You can go through empire after empire, you'll see similar, you know, because as a population becomes wealthier, they become more decadent and more dependent on debt, but simultaneously less productive than more reliant on the state. And this leads to the insolvency eventually of the state. You know, this this lack of productivity and reliance on debt leads to increasing wealth disparity. So you have the wealth gap widening and then civil unrest erupts because people are angry. They're not as well off as they used to be, but they don't know why. So they just start identifying enemies and incriminating them, uh, whether it's the fossil fuel industry, whether it's big corp, whatever you name it. And then simultaneously, you see the rise of external powers, somebody who's ready to challenge the global superpower. And so when you look at the geopolitical landscape today, David, like, you know, the globe, where do any nations, any geographies stand out to you as good bets, uh, countries or regions with great access to geology, resources, good demographics, decent balance sheets, strong leadership, all of this stuff. Does anywhere strike you as strong right now? Certainly the obvious choice would be China. Okay. The, prob okay. the problem is that China, the only reason I can't come right out and say, I think that's what happens. I, I have used the analogy before of coming out of 1987, late 80s, you know, 89, um, you know, coming out off the big decline in 87 in the markets, um, Japan didn't go down nearly as much as we did, but then we, you know, when you look at the top in Japan in 89, they haven't come back to that since. Mm. And we, we, at that time, it was all, I was around and it was all the, you know, the mantra that the U S was losing its, its ground to Japan and Japan was, you know, eating our lunch. They had re-engineered a lot of, they took a lot of our ingenuity and just kind of re-engineered it. And they were much, you know, people talked about the public-private approach that Japan had, et cetera. And then what happened? They peaked out in 89 and haven't seen it since. Um, you know, the country's been okay, but, you know, look at where they're at now, and I think they're in trouble. Um, I use the analogy that we are Japan of 1989, and China is us. Uh, because after 89, look where our markets went. You know, we we took off and didn't look back. And we've been the the strongest, you know, in a lot of ways, the strongest uh, worldwide economy since. However, so it'd be easy for me to say China's, you know, going to gonna be the next leadership. And I, I still think that's the most likely. The problem is this last 20 years, China's miracle was all fueled by debt. Yeah, I mean they're they're more leveraged than we are by a long shot, and obviously they're starting to run into real problems over there. So I just don't know what I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens in China during the global bust next year. You know, because they're obviously at a place where they're almost no growth, and we always heard that you know things turn pretty chaotic over there if they couldn't sustain their growth. So that's a question. On the other hand, militarily, they're eating our lunch right now. We're, you know, we're basically seeing our military atrophy purposely. I mean, the, you know, we're being, we're seeing certainly one administration doing all they can to weaken the military, to focus on, you know, woke agenda, et cetera, um, not building new submarines to anywhere near the extent they should, not building new ships to the extent they should. You know, our our technology on the aircraft side is, you know, we're not generating the kind of new technology there that we should be. Meanwhile, China's putting all kinds of money into that. And, you know, their submarine fleet is larger than ours now, which was unheard of 20 years ago. So, so there are a lot of signs that whether it's purposeful or whether it's exactly, as you say, countries get complacent and kind of fall by the wayside on, on you know, just, just a natural course of, of um, things. I, I personally think it's some of both, um, but it does argue that we may be in the twilight of our, you know, our power, certainly. And I say, oh, you're, you're Canadian, I guess I mean, ours meaning the U.S.
I'm Jay Martin. On November 30th, I'll be hosting an exclusive live online video event called Crisis and Chaos, The Changing World Order. I'll be joined by some of the world's top military experts, geopolitical analysts, and economic advisors. They'll be answering my questions and yours about the cascade of global crises since COVID-19. This event is for anyone trying to make sense of our crazy world. Find out what could be coming next and how you can prepare your mind, your money, and your family. Crisis and Chaos, The Changing World Order, an exclusive live online video event on November 30th. Click below to purchase your ticket now. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in the same boat. And, you know, my family's dual citizenship. My wife's American. My kids are dual. And we, uh, well, anyways, wouldn't say we're doing much better up here, David. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, you guys, uh, you know, you may have a younger leader, but I'm not sure he's better. <laughs> no, I think Canada is learning a hard lesson right now. on What happens when you elect a prime minister because you like his haircut? I think that's what happened. Right. To be honest. We elected you. So the previous prime minister, Prime Minister Harper, who I've had on my podcast a couple of times, the biggest complaint about him when he was in office towards the end of his tenure was that he was boring. That that was the, that's what that's the best that media could do to him. Was he's boring, yeah. right? Like what what does that mean? He did his job quietly. Like how how yeah. nice would that be, right? We, we um, would sure love boring right now, right? We love boring. We love boring. Boring got Canada through the 2008 financial crisis with a healthier balance sheet than any other G7 nation because we had a leader who leveraged our resource economy efficiently. And you know, it's it it comes down to leadership sometimes, doesn't it? I mean all the time. But right now it's it's the big red flag I see with, you know, Western powers, right? And I'm I'm speaking about, you know, America mainly, um, you know, not so much Canada, but with the right leadership, you know, I think the ship can be righted, right? And uh access Absolutely. to resources, access to a productive population, a very entrepreneurial population, um, healthy culture. Yes, there's civil divisions and all kinds of this, you know, if for sure it exists. You know, having said that, when I interviewed Prime Minister Harper last, I said, Kind of walked him through the trajectory of civil divisions and unrest, you know, in the West. And I said, I, I don't know how this repairs itself. Like we seem to have crossed the point of no return. We've crossed the Rubicon, where we can no longer have civil discourse because we're so far apart. And he gave me a great perspective. He said, Look, Jay, I grew up in an era uh, where civil unrest got so bad that political leaders, including presidents, were being assassinated. So I was like, Oh, you, you know what? That, that's great perspective, right? And it's true. We're, we've been to pretty rough places before and then come back stronger. And so, you know, I I, I, I remember that often when I think that like, we've passed the point of no return and things can't get better from here. It's like, well, we may be gone further down the path and, and recovered. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, certainly. I mean, if you want to be hopeful, that's certainly where I would go with it. Because, sir, I, you know, I grew up in the 60s and, and was in college during the, you know, 69 to 73 period where, you know, we had Kent State. We had, uh, you know, civilians being shot by the National Guard. We had rioting yeah. in the streets in Chicago. Chicago and, riots. Crazy. Yep. yep. Yeah. And, and you know, we had um, basically Students for a Democratic Society was a communist group that, you know, pushed an agenda that was very left of, of center and very anti-American. Mm. Uh, and a lot of those people grew up and got into many, many of our mainstream institutions and that's where a lot of our changes have come from. Um, so, but, so if, if you want to be hopeful, yeah, you can say we go through these cycles and we, you know, we seem to come out of them. What makes this one different, I think, um, is it's, it's not the youth they're doing this. It's really, I mean, there's, there's a, a uh, when you look at our government, there be, between you know one party which we know which party uh you know between the left and the establishment republicans you've got an awful lot of them looking like they really are orchestrating efforts that are anti-american or or certainly anti-capitalist or or uh, it looks like an awful lot of our politicians have sold out um some sold out just to make money to lobbyists, what have you, some seem to have sold out to other countries and our enemies. And um, and we've got that whole new world order agenda, which I call code for communist takeover of the world, meaning Russia and China are behind it. Um, 
you know, just a, a simple example right now of of um, what well, seems like very mass backward policy that you you couldn't do if it weren't it has to be deliberate is you see what's happening in the middle east you see what happened um you know with hamas and israel and we know that iran's behind all that and is funding that and biden decides to you know shove another 10 billion dollars at iran you know right in the midst of that after we're already having to face the controversy of the last amount that they you know, basically gave back. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you start wondering who who is running the show and what's their motivation. Is it? It certainly doesn't seem like it's for the American people. So, um, you know, I I I do question. And then you you know talk about new world order. You see, you know, the Klaus Schwabs. They're not making any secret of the desire to do away with sovereignty and in the free world and basically have a one world government, meaning, you know, something like the United Nations running the world, you know, the World Health Organization deciding for people in Canada or the U.S. how, you know, what their vaccine policy should be, et cetera. I mean, we're really moving away from, just speaking as an American, moving away from what's really been the heart and soul of this country forever, which is individualism and, you know, and sovereignty. And there seems to be a very concerted, deliberate effort to do that on the part of the leadership in this country. Yeah. Okay. So some big threads I need to pull on here. So, uh, man, where do I want to start? So first of all, the concept concept of the one world government, I mean, I just, I find it, I hear this, you know, I, I, I see it, I find it unbelievable that anybody could realistically think this is accomplishable when you look at the track record of centralization just in general right the more you centralize a system the larger it becomes the more vulnerable it becomes to black swan events and eventually they all collapse on themselves i mean the more you centralize that's that's i failed to find an example where that has not been the case um and so to to i mean look at like a yeah. Anyway, so I I just I find the whole concept fallacy and just so short sighted. I, I agree. I think the piece you may be missing, I'm not sure, is that I think this is uh, these are evil people. This is a deliberate effort. Like I said, I viewed New World Order as code for communist takeover of the world. You know, are the communists uh, are they interested in doing it the most efficient way or doing it right. the way that it would it'd be best? No, it's it's about those in power wanting more power. I, I you know I can't get into the heads of those because I, I was raised in the opposite environment, so I, it's hard for me to understand how anybody would want that. You know, it's it's hurting your people. It's hurting, but they seem to be just evil people that want to consolidate power. And I think we have a lot of people in our country in place of power that are very compromised one way or another that seem to be selling out to that same viewpoint. So it doesn't come from a logical standpoint. It doesn't come from a good place. It really comes from a corrupt place, in my opinion. Yeah, you're right. And it's not stopped people in the past. That's a great, that's a great point, right? How how many times have we seen uh, pursuit of absolute power, regardless of the reality of of that uh, occurring successfully, um, kind of on repeat throughout history? Uh, empire builders, et cetera. Okay. So then back to the concept that here's something I've been thinking about. So America was founded on the concept of individuality, individual, individuality and sovereignty, right? And, you know, the American experiment, one of the geniuses of it was that the constitution really limited the power of the president. It's built to be an inefficient government because that puts the power in the hands of the people. Whereas actually a, a prime minister, for example, has a lot more power uh, than an American president, which is not a good thing. You know, it's 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 not, uh, in my opinion. That's how I see it. Uh, so if you've got a system that's always rewarded individuality and sovereignty, and that's been the bread and butter of this nation and helped grow it, but eventually now it's grown to a point where we're now punishing individuality and sovereignty, those individuals who have come up in that era, they're going to jump ship. I mean, I'm debating jumping ship in Canada, right? I 
I feel really fortunate that I grew up in a country during an era that had safe, predictable governance and tons of opportunity, right? I'm a benef- I benefited from that. But it no longer, I no longer see that or it doesn't resonate as much with me. Um, and so we're putting down roots in Indonesia. We're exploring south of the border uh, to, to go back stateside. Um, and I have friends who are like, how could you jump ship on the country that's given so much to you? And my response is like, well, it did give me a lot. Um, but over the last 20 years, I've employed hundreds of people in this country and paid millions in taxes. And here I stand today and it's like, I don't feel my contribution is being recognized or rewarded anymore. And so the characteristics of individuality and sovereignty that I've embraced thus far now take me out of the country because I got to, that's where, that's the next logical step. If you're thinking yeah, about, I, right. I'm, I'm with you. Absolutely. And, right. and that's, that's the problem. I mean, I, I grew up believing in the U.S. system had tremendous checks and balances. I used to argue that maybe I'm more on the right, but I'm very comfortable with the fact that the pendulum swings, you know, somewhat to the right and then swings back somewhat to the left and it keeps us kind of in the middle and, and centered. That's all gone. I mean, the system you look at it today, if you don't like the, you know, the Supreme Court, you're not going to wait for your elected officials to get into power and and you know through um democracy vote in the judges you think should be there you're going to pack the court and and basically corrupt the court so that it it does what you want because you're in power now and you're going to do whatever you want um when you have a, a a politician that totally goes against your beliefs you indict him. You you I, indict him four times, and you yeah. basically uh, practice the um, politics of self of of personal character assassination. Um, such and and you have the cooperation of the media, such that you know every time you turn around, there's more hammered at that one person because you don't want that agenda anywhere near because it will disrupt your your plans and your plans are not necessarily pro-american but but uh I, I, that's you know to put it clearly i believe i believe the vac i believe the virus was sick on the world and particularly sick on us um as the last thing to stop trump because he was on a roll you know <laughs> and to stop that election when that didn't necessarily work and I'll say it right here. They stole the election. There's no question. There's plenty of evidence that that election was not Joe Biden's election. Um, when that didn't work, <laughs> um, or it did work, but he's still standing. You just keep hitting him and hitting him. And yet he's, you know, fortunately, he's got a backbone unlike any politician I've ever seen. And he's still standing up to it. We'll see what happens in the election. But the reason he's getting hit as hard as he is is because he refused to back down. You know, it's the one the one person for whatever reason who has been willing to take all these hits. So I don't know of any other politician in my lifetime, including Ronald Reagan, and they were all hit pretty hard from the left. Mm. But I don't know of any of them that could have withstood what he's he's been had to endure. And I'm not saying he's a perfect politician or anything else, but it's very clear this is a gender driven yeah okay so so okay so given given uh the midst of all of this chaos um and the uncertainty uh that comes as a consequence of it what i would say is most important for any individual to do at this moment is to build your bank account because the only way to protect your sovereignty one of the best ways to protect your sovereignty is to build your bank account. And money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you options, right? And it can help solve problems. Uh, yep. That's very, very important. And I, I think it's there's an awakening occurring that building wealth is a noble endeavor, right? It, it's it's something we should all pursue because it, you never know. It's interesting you say that because I, I get a lot of, I, I try not to go out to the 2030s because it is a pretty doom and gloom scenario. You know, I don't have any answers for that period. So, but people automatically want to jump past this decade into that. And what do I do? What should I do? 
And I go, my only answer, which is similar to what you just said, is you've got this decade to get your house in order. Get your financial house in order so you do have options. Because those are the people that have any fighting chance in what's coming. And, you know, it's a, it's not a long period of time, but given the kind of cycles I think we're facing, the you know, this melt up and bust and then uh, a huge commodity cycle, there is a, a chance to build wealth in those kind of environments if you're smart about it and you don't get caught up in the, you know, the consensus chasing your tail type of thing. So set up 2030. Our mission is to get our house in order for the balance of this decade and put as much away as we can so that we can weather whatever storms uh, may fall in front of us. I don't have the, I'm not bold enough to jump into the S&P on that rally that you know seems to be materializing right before our eyes because last time you're on my show, you made this claim and I actually had a lot of people be like, this is crazy. How could he see a rally? <laughs> you know? Well, it's, it's happening. So, so, but I, I don't have, I'm cautious about that. I just, I feel like I like to buy things that I believe are cheap. And I just don't believe the S and P is cheap because I have no confidence in my ability to time markets, but I can determine when something's cheap and when it's expensive. And I buy it when it's cheap and sell it when it's expensive, blah. So where, where are you looking? So aside from this rally in the S and P, where would you look, right? It's 2023. We got seven years to get our house in order. You want to invest accordingly. I'm a long-term value investor, not a short-term thinker or trader. You know, where is the capital being allocated right now that'll set us up for, for seven yeah, so, years down the path? So I have to walk a careful line of not providing advice. Um, I'm not a financial advisor, so I can talk from the standpoint of the markets, and I think people can derive from that. Um, I believe um, the precious metals are at a major bottom, you know, gold's a little more advanced than silver is at this point, you know, it's it's up from 1650 to 1950. So whereas silver, I think flat ends back, it's up a little bit too from, you know, it's lows of a couple of years ago. But, um, but ultimately I think in the inflation cycle to come, um, the press metals will probably top the performance list. Oil will do very well. Commodities in general will do very well. But as you move through the decade, each one of those will drop off as the economy starts running into more problems. And I think the thing that will kind of peak out at last will be the precious metals because inflation is going to be roaring away. Um, you, you have the advantage of being kind of cake and eat it too type of story and that they're so cheap right now, um, unlike equities equities are you know pretty high valuation so even though i'm calling for potentially a 50 50 percent run in the market here in the next six months or less um crazy as that sounds from high levels that we're at you know so you have to kind of understand it's it's where you are in the cycle with equity whereas with the others they are a value play they're flat on their back particularly the miners it's, it's not a well-managed industry, as you know. Um, they've struggled. But a lot of that struggle has been, you know, there's a lot of, the mines are in bad places and, you know, places where there's a lot of leftist governments trying to tax away your profits, et cetera, or, or just uh, abscond away with the, the prof, with the mines. But, but so, so it's, it's a harder industry to operate in. And I think those managements are, you know, not great, but they're doing the best they can under the circumstances. But I do believe that's an area. The only caveat is that there's a, as I say, it's like standing on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, looking across to the north rim and thinking it can walk straight across. There's a canyon in between. Well, there's a canyon between this run up that I think we're going to have in metals this year, or, you know, the rest of this year and early next, first half of next um, and then the bust can take them all the way back here, maybe, or two thirds of the way back here. And then the true cycle begins on the other side of the bust or in the midst of the bust. So you just have to understand that. And, and as you know, I hear a lot of people talking about us being in a commodity super cycle. I go, the real commodity super cycle starts on the other side of the bust. Um, mm. You know, if you, if you try to hold straight through it, you know, I think oil is going to $30 next year. 
Oh. So if you try to hold through oil, I think oil is going to 60 here short term next few months and and 30 in the bust. So if you try to hold through it here, yeah, ultimately you're going to 500. So, you know, it's not a big deal as long as you have staying power. But just understand there's that that difficult period, probably, you know, a nine month period between, you know, spring, summer of next year and and uh, second quarter of 2025. And so as long as you know what you're getting into, you can buy and hold. But you better understand there's some big volatility um, coming. Um, but on the other side of that, yes, the commodities are presenting a great opportunity. Um, you can build wealth because some of these things are going to be up tenfold or more. Um, you know, producers, certainly producers will. Some of the commodities may be too. Um, industrials, I think, will be another area in the market that I think um, will be among the performers. The key in the next cycle will be being in industries and stocks where the companies can out earn inflation. So if they have pricing power, um, they can out, you know, that's why pressed metals or commodities are so, so big in that period is they're going to, their prices are going to rob faster than the overall inflation rate. So yes, their cost of operating is going to go up, but they're going to have huge pricing power on the goods they sell. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in consumer products or housing or uh, financial, you're going to be dealing with high inflation and pretty tight margins, you know, skinny margins, what makes it, which makes it very hard for you to keep ahead of inflation mm -hmm. in terms of your earnings. And you're also going to be facing a huge headwind in terms of rising interest rates and, and uh, shrinking PE multiples. So, you know, the ones that can out, outdo that kind of a, a difficulty are going to be the ones that have that tremendous pricing power, oil, you know, gold, silver, copper, um, probably some of the commodity, the ag com commodities. Okay. Now this, so markers like $30 oil next year on the back of a global bust, this is a consequence of just flat out demand destruction. Is that it? Or is it like a liquidity crisis when everything that's not bolted to the floor gets sold in order to raise cash or a combination of both? Or if you could walk me through the moving parts there. Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you in, in shorthand and I'll elaborate on it. Shorthand is I say um, a highly leveraged economy, meaning massive debt that we've built up to 300 plus trillion dollars globally now, um, combined with a basically fragile economy due to, you know, partially due to the pandemic that threw off a lot of things that we're still dealing with, um, combined with a huge policy error on the part of the central banks, because I think they are, they're trying to manage policy, um, basically looking at current information, current data, which is backward looking, uh, when there are leads and lags of six to nine months. Mm -hmm. So that means you're almost guaranteeing you're going to stay tight too long. You stay tight too long. We've seen the, you know, in every cycle that happens, almost every Fed cycle, they tighten and they tighten and then they create a recession and then they have to come scrambling back. What makes this cycle so unique is that we've never had leverage anywhere near this before. You know, we've We've levered up so much higher than we were even in 2008-9, and that was a leveraged economy. So a policy error in a highly leveraged economy means a much bigger hit. You know, the leverage works both ways. On the way up, it helps you. On the way down, it really hurts you. So that high leverage in the financial system, high leverage in companies, um, high leverage across the board, will be hit hard because of a pol or the policy mistake will be magnified because of that leverage. Mm -hmm. So you put that all together and you get a global bust, uh, which I define as something we haven't had in the post-World War II era. Um, 2008, nine, we almost got there when GE Capital, when they almost closed the commercial paper uh, market down, GE Capital or GE was, you know, minutes away or days away from, basically shutting its doors, you know, or, or bankruptcy. 
uh-huh. they they fortunately responded quickly and opened it up and you know uh, pumped money in etc i this time around i think we're going to go over that cliff you know we almost got there last time but we pulled it back from the cliff this time i think we go over it and that means there's going to be several major banks um going under you know who knows what other financial companies um i think you look at private equity which is obviously high leverage entities mm-hmm. and people have been you know the endowments and the pension funds have been putting private equity into their plans in a big way because it took away the volatility of the stock market thinking it was safer yeah i think you're gonna find out you don't get safer by going into more leverage vehicles so I think private equity is going to be a big problem in the bust. Mm-hmm. Um, pension funds in general are going to be very underfunded and a problem. So I think across the board, we've just built excesses at a, at a time uh, to to an extreme. And now we have policy errors that are at an extreme. And I think the two collide and you know the, the end result is something that's not very pretty. What happens to the $2 trillion deficit in that scenario? I was chatting with Michael Pento recently, and he said it turns to a $6 trillion deficit. What, what do you think? Yeah, well, that's when I when I say $20 trillion, uh, coming out of the Fed. So, you know, the Fed balance sheet was $9 trillion. It's probably 8 now. You know, they've mm. been shrinking it a little bit. So let's say we get to $30 trillion as a result of the bus. So sometime between... Second half of next year and the end of 2025, I think you'll be up to something close to 30 trillion. I think that will be pretty much matched by fiscal stimulus. So they'll be they'll be coming up. We saw what happened in 2020. This will be many times that, but they'll be coming up with all these programs to deal with pension funds that are failing, to deal with banks that are failing, to deal with um you know, all kinds of stuff. Medicaid, we're going to expand Medicaid so everybody gets it or whatever. They're going to they're going to be doing everything they can think of to re-stimulate the system or to you know turn it around. Mm-hmm. Um, that means you could have, and again, it may not be equal to the Fed, but let's say it is, you could have another twenty trillion in government debt in the U.S. monetized by the twenty trillion. QE. In other words, QE is obviously to, to do QE, you buy debt, right? Now, typically that debt is sold to the dealer banks and then you buy it from the dealer banks, you know, in repos. But we may see, uh, and this was talked about in the Bernanke era, we may see direct, you know, the Fed just buys the debt direct from the government, right? Monetizes the debt without going through a middleman. Um, I think you're going to see things like that potentially. But either way, if QE expands by 20 trillion, my guess is an awful lot is going to be new debt coming out of the, out of the government. So, so yeah. it's not six trillion. I think it's closer to you know 15 or 20 trillion in in new debt. Um, Got it. Got and that's it. why I say you get to the other side of that equation, and and once you know with a two or three year lag, you're up to double digit interest rates and on your way to 20 percent interest rates. There's no equation I can come up with that says that the government's going to be able to fund its debt or, or services debt. I mean, it it will have trouble servicing that at 5%. Never mind. And the first the first year or two out of the the um, bust, you're coming out, I think it's a deflationary bust, by the way. It will be short-lived, but I think for, you know, six, nine, 12 months, you'll see deflation. So interest rates, I'm, I'm expecting the 10-year to fall to 0% might even go below zero during that QE, during during that 20 trillion. Um, it's going to be driving rates through the to the floor. Short rates will be negative, I believe, in spite of Paul not wanting to see negative rates. Okay. Um, if we have that, um, you for a year or two coming out of the bus, you might you might have a year, maybe 18 months, where rates are still low. And where they might actually, stupid as it is to do, sell debt to help service the debt. And that's a loser's proposition, as you know, because it's going to pour more gasoline on the coming inflation fire. And 
ultimately, I think by I say 2026, twenty six seven, that game's over. There's no MMT. There's no, I mean, which is a foolish concept. There's no yield curve control. It's going to be explosive in terms of rates moving up and the government very quickly realizing we're out of ammunition. We don't have a way to service the debt. Mm. So, so I think the government basically loses its access to the capital markets late in the decade, whether that's 2028 or nine, somewhere where, you know, Who's going to buy the U.S. debt when they see the balance sheet, when they see the inability to service it? The Fed's going to be out of the game because, as I say, it's like California forest fire and saying, I'm going to, you know, I got a hose here with gasoline coming out of it. I'm just going to spray it on the fire. You can't do it. You know, the Fed's going to be shut down. Printing press is shut down. And the only thing that's really kept us going for these last few cycles to keep our standard of living halfway up there has been government right it's been expansion of government it's not yeah. it's not sustainable and now i think it's hit that brick wall or will have by you know the end of next year david i want to thank you for coming on the show and chatting with me and my audience and i'd love to send people to where they can hear more from you so of course david h contrarian at twitter on your on twitter you're very active on twitter but where else should we send people today who want to hear more of what you yeah have to yeah just just to be sure it's it's at dave h contrarian so it's not david it's dave um so dave h contrarian i always um caution people that there's a lot of fake accounts on twitter yeah, which use my i'm sure you run this too or use my profile picture um and it, the best way to tell the difference, I've got 194,000 followers. Most of those fake accounts have less than 1,000 followers. So, you know, look at that uh, and also just be very aware that they might change a letter in the in the you know, yeah. username. Um, if it's pitching so, you to crypto altcoins then. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I do, that's right. I, I do not on Twitter solicit anybody. So if somebody's soliciting you or uh send you a telegram or something that's not me um so that's the first precaution i know i do have uh, an investment letter quarterly uh, macro letter that i put out by subscription uh if anybody's interested it obviously has it comes with a cost um if anybody's interested they can direct message me on twitter and i'll provide details okay excellent at Dave H. Contrarian on Twitter. Uh, hit him up if you want the quarterly macro letter. Dave, it's been a pleasure having you on. Yeah, it's always fascinating chatting with you. We cover a lot of ground and uh, you're an audience audience favorite. So I appreciate your time. Yeah, they're, they're keeping me out of the mental institution so far. So I, I may be starting <laughs> to find crazy, but... <laughs> be, be careful out there. Right, exactly. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it, man. Okay. Thanks again. Hey, thanks, Jay. Crisis and Chaos, The Changing World Order, an exclusive live online video event on November 30th. Click below to purchase your ticket now.